I think that a lot of farmers, especially the ones here in Alabama, are not going to take too kindly to the idea of, well, the Fed will own the land and, and we'll just allow you to live on it and cultivate it. I, I don't think that that's going to be uh, something that they're in favor of. Yeah, I would agree 100 percent. I mean, that goes against everything that, that our policy would, would stand on as far as land ownership and, and, and that type of thing. So that's something we would fight very hard. Um, you know, I guess it's more specifics come, up, come out around the 30 by 30 plan. We'll, we'll know kind of, just like you were saying, we'll know what areas to really push back on. But at this point, it's, you know, we're not even sure, you know, what the, the proposal would actually do. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, Good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. My next guest is Mr. Mitt Walker. He is the Director of National Affairs for the Alabama Farmers Federation, here to talk to us about something that, frankly, I think there has been a, a grave deal of injustice in the fact that we have not been talking about this. This is a really big national story that could affect our lives in, in several significant ways. And the fact that it hasn't gotten more media attention, I think, is, is frankly kind of sad. And so we're going to do our part here at Tactics to shed some light on that. So let's go ahead and welcome in Mr. Mitt Walker. Thank you so much for being with, uh, with us here, Mr. Walker. Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, always a, uh, a pleasure to get to talk to some Farmers Federation folks. Um, I don't know if you knew this about me, but I'm actually a former state officer and an ag comm major. So uh, I have a little background in this stuff. So yep. um, speaking of that, if you would go ahead and give the audience a little bit of background information on you, kind of how you got to be with the Farmers Federation and, and the reason that you're interested uh, in these kinds of, you know, national affairs. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I had kind of a, a different path to get here. I actually um, went to college at Troy University and uh, studied environmental science there and worked for about six years for the state environmental management department and had an opportunity to move over to Alpha uh, about 16 years ago now. Um, initially worked with a couple of our uh, commodity divisions, catfish, goats, sheep, uh, worked with a leadership program here and about 11 years ago transitioned over to kind of keeping an eye on all things at the federal level. So really any issues that affect farmers, rural Alabama, and uh, really on any given day, there's there's several of those happening in Washington that, that we have to keep an eye on. Yeah, I think people really don't realize and, and understand just because they haven't been taught how pervasive agriculture is, how the, the prices of food affect the prices of everything else, and how much of an impact that agriculture has in their daily lives, both with what you're talking about at the federal level or also at the state level. Um, people don't realize how big agriculture is. And I mean, it's a fifth of our economy. And so it really does span a lot of different industries. Sure. Yeah. We, we like to say around here, if you ate today, then you have a vested interest in agriculture. So uh, it is something that does affect all of us. And it has a huge impact on our state's economy. Agriculture is the largest industry in Alabama, um, somewhere north of $70 billion of economic impact on an annual basis. When you look at, you know, the, the farms, all of the supply industries, the trucking, all of the things that go into moving commodities around, it certainly has a, a large impact on the state. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I would just, because I think most people, because they aren't really familiar with agriculture, and like I said, maybe the scope of it, they probably also are not familiar with the estate tax and, and what a big impact it has on that. So before we get into the topic that we're actually going to be discussing today, some of the changes to that, if you could just kind of lay the groundwork for my audience and explain how the estate tax as it exists today is already seriously affecting American farmers. Sure. The state tax, put very simply, is a tax that is imposed when um, land assets and those types of things are transferred from one generation to the next. So, for example, most of our farms in the state, you know, 90 percent of them or are, are more are family farms. So mm -hmm. when the father, the mother, the grandfather, um, you know, passes away, when those assets are transferred, there is a, a tax levied on that at the time of transfer. Now, thankfully, under current law, um, the, um, let's see, 
the tax cut and jobs act i went blank on the, the name of the the big tax proposal or package that trump, trump uh pushed through early in his tenure it doubled the exemption levels so right now under current law most of our farmers are in pretty good shape as far as the exemption levels for married couples it's, it's well it's above 20 million dollars that could be transferred with no taxes the concern is that is temporary law and there are a couple of proposals out there now that would bring that exemption level way down. So we have a saying here that farmers are land rich and cash poor. And what that really means, Caleb, is most of a farm's assets are tied up in what it takes, you know, for them to make their living. It's land, it's tractors, it's combines. Mm -hmm. um, all of the things that go into to producing a crop or, or raising livestock, it's all tied back to the farm. So when an untimely death occurs, a lot of times there's not cash available to pay that tax bill that's due upon upon death. So leaves farmers facing a very tough proposition. Sometimes it means selling a piece of the family farm. Sometimes it means selling equipment. Sometimes it means selling other things to pay that tax bill, which in turn makes them less productive. They're having mm -hmm. to give up an integral part of, of what they re rely on to produce their crops. Right. I mean, you might actually be able to pay it because you do have a lot of assets, but if you need that asset to be able to produce for yourself and your family, then selling the asset is a non-starter. And so unfortunately, just as the estate tax exists, you know, before we're talking about any of these changes, it's not at all an uncommon story for these estate taxes to hit farm families really hard. Now, corporations don't have that problem. Uh, and so the, you know, we talk a lot about corporate farming and I say that's a bit of a misnomer because even most of our corporate farms are in some way family owned as well. They just happen to be larger. Uh, sure. but, but either way, like you're usually your larger corporations that own several farms, they can handle this kind of thing a lot better than a lot of smaller family farms. And, and when this hits them, it can devastate them and even drive them straight out of business. Yeah. Yeah. You know, farmers, you know, they face so much uncertainty in a, in a, every year it's weather it's you know it's insects it's all of these things that are out of their control uh prices you know farmers are unfortunately are price takers not price makers and mm -hmm. um you know you have to depend on making your living on a whole variety of things that frankly you really don't have any control over and it's really unfortunate that the federal government is in a position to bring even more uncertainty into you know, how you manage your farm finances, because there is this uncertainty with what the tax code would look like moving forward. So while we're, we're in fairly good shape now, the, the future is a little, little rocky and that's just more uncertainty that they're having to deal with. Yeah, I believe it was Ronald Reagan that actually said that farmers already have to face uh, weather calamities and insects. They ought not have to fight their government on top of all that. And I mean, I thought that was with sentiment that I could really relate to. Um, yeah. So now that people kind of understand how devastating that can be, the estate tax can be to a family farm, uh, if you would talk about some of the, the new proposals that have been brought up, because I, I know one of them that I wanted to discuss with you was the, the new way that they're going to be assessing and they're talking about passing an appreciation tax. And so yeah. this would apply across the board, but it would really affect farmers. So for example, let's say, um, not that I have one of these, so don't come looking for it, but uh, let's say that I have a, a issue one action comics, the original Superman comic book. Well, that's more valuable now than it was in 2005 or 2010. And so what they're talking about is taxing any appreciation on any assets you have. And so as you can you know, tell from, from that with farming, if you have land that was valued as one thing when you originally bought it or your family originally inherited it versus what it is now, that could have a devastating effect on farmers if they start all of a sudden taxing how much their land or their other property has appreciated in the time since they purchased it. So if you could just kind of talk about what impact that could have on farmers. Yeah, that is one that is, is certainly new on the horizon. Um, there's a piece of legislation called the STEP Act um, pending in, in Congress now. And, and it does exactly what you described. So under current law, um, under capital gains taxes, there's a provision called stepped up basis. Uh, so, so what happens, you know, say, say you use a three generation farm as an example. Grandfather buys a piece of property that's valued at a, at a certain 
you know, level when he purchased it, say, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. When it transferred to his son or daughter, that property is then assessed at a new basis. The, the basis is, is stepped up is, is the term we use. So from the day you acquire that piece of property, the, the value resets. So as you transfer it to that next generation, they have the opportunity to reset that value again. And, and what it really boils down to, I mean, when you look at cropland across the country, um, farmland has tripled in, in value in just a, a, a few short decades. Um, if you're forced to pay, and the other thing is it's under current law, you don't have to pay those taxes at the time of death. That, tr that property transfers to the next generation. Um, now, if it's sold, then you would pay taxes on it at that time. This mm -hmm. new idea that's floating around D.C. now would require taxes be paid at the time of transfer, not at the time that it's actually sold. Um, it could have a devastating impact on farmers. In fact, Texas A&M just released a, a new study. They have what's called representative farms. There are 94 farms all across the country that are real working farms that they're um, their professors go and gather the, the real farm data on an annual basis. What are they producing? What did they receive? What were their input costs? And those type, types of things. They ran this, this new legislation through their model to see how it would impact the farms. 92 of those 94 farms would pay a significantly higher tax bill. So it is a very far reaching um, rule change that would have devastating impacts. Again, you know, you can't predict when someone's going to pass away, mm -hmm. um, you know, and to, to make business decisions for this crop year, the next crop year, again, it goes back to what we talked about a while ago. Our farmers need certainty in their tax code to know how to manage their finances so that they can do the best job they can to feed and clothe the world. Well, and it is really sad because, and I don't know where you stand politically, you know, really it doesn't matter when we're talking about an issue this specific, um, but it just seems as though the Democrats, which always claim to be the party of the little guy and they don't like corporations and they don't like big business getting involved and they actually come out against uh, what we would refer to as corporate farms or factory farms, it seems like this policy, which is being pushed by a lot of them, would actually run a lot of the family farmers out of business and those farms and assets would be bought up by big corporations. And then, you know, uh, there would actually be a larger percentage of our farm food fiber resources actually coming from corporate farms. Yeah, that is certainly a concern. You know, one of the things our smaller and even um, medium sized type family farms you know, they don't have the resources to, to do all this financial planning that, that some of the bigger operations might have. Um, you know, the, the whole concept of corporate farms and, 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 and those types of things, it, it is unfortunate that that term is out there because just like you were describing, I mean, most of our farms in Alabama, even the large ones, they're family operations. They right. simply get bigger to survive. I mean, when you look at going out and buying a cotton picker today, if you buy a new piece of equipment, a cotton picker is going to cost you almost a million dollars new mm -hmm. off the lot. Well, you got to roll that cotton picker across quite a few acres to make that, you know, payment. At the end of the right. Year. You ain't making that back in one year. That's for sure. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, unfortunately, um, and, and it strains some of our farmers to have to get bigger. It's more time, it's more hours. Um, I won't even get into the labor concerns that we're facing right now. Um, you know, finding folks to work on the farm is a, a very difficult task these days. So, yeah, they've had to get bigger, but it's not necessarily always their desire to do so. It's simply a matter of, of staying alive. I mean, you, you've had to get bigger to survive. Yeah, that does happen quite a bit. And one thing that I think could equally have now, this one is not being proposed as legislation. I'm not sure if you have heard of this uh, so far or not. This is really coming more from the think tanks and people that are kind of in the initial planning stages of this. But there have been several people that have been proposing a wealth tax. And so you wouldn't just be taxing appreciation of, of assets that you have, and you wouldn't just be taxing when somebody dies or your income and all that. They're saying, and, and some people are proposing a one-time tax, some people are proposing, you know, maybe once every five years, something like that. But this thing is kind of in the works that they would be taxing just basically your net worth every so often. And if that happened, that could really have a devastating effect on farmers too, because 
uh, is kind of like you were saying, they're land rich and farm poor. If you look on paper at all the farmer's assets, they look like a rich person, but their cash flow is actually pretty small and their profit margin is very narrow. And so how could this really affect the farmers, both of Alabama and of the country as a whole? Well, it's unfortunate. I mean, when those types of policies are, are proposed or discussed, you know, my personal opinion is, I mean, you're basically penalizing someone for their success. It, it's the exact opposite of what we learned as kids growing up. You know, the American dream, you go out, you work hard, you invest your earnings, and then you grow your business. And, you know, that's that's what we should be advocating for. And unfortunately, you know, these concepts of penalizing those that have been successful, um, it does real harm um, to those individuals. But it also, if you think about, again, going back to the number of employees that are on these farms, mm -hmm. the, the other businesses that are associated with these farms, when you're taking money out of the, the farmer's pockets, that's less money they're able to reinvest in their rural communities. And, you know, we, we all know what, what a struggle it is for a lot of the rural parts of Alabama to <clears throat> keep people there. People are leaving rural Alabama. They're going looking for jobs in other places. You know, the farms across the countryside, they're reinvesting their profits every year in those local communities, and it makes a huge impact on that local economy. Well, it, it certainly makes a huge impact on the local economy, but I think right now, especially with some of the things that we're seeing in the prices of beef and other commodities just going up much more than we anticipated in a very short amount of time, I think people are starting to realize that this is something that affects them as well, because if we're going to see all these massive overhead in the form of wealth tax or appreciation tax or estate tax, um, that is going to be reflected in the cost of food and other resources. And as we can kind of see from, from what we've seen that happen already, that affects everything else. I mean, that affects uh, fuel cost. It affects uh, the price of everything, because if you have to pay more to feed a person, then, you know, a business that might have nothing to do with agriculture, you know, let's say that you're uh, uh, involved in healthcare or something like that. Well, if their employees now need more money to be able to eat, they have to pay those people more. And so it has a devastating effect on the economy and costs as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, our, our farmers are working day in and day out to provide the safest, more, most affordable food supply they possibly can for, for our country and, and frankly, other people around the world. Um, we do depend on a, a large number of exports as well. Um, but when you look at you know, the cost of food, the cost of all of those things that go into producing the food, the farmer gets a very, very small percentage of that overall price. So when you see, you know, a ribeye, for example, that's eleven ninety five at the grocery store per pound, you know, the, the farmer's not seeing nearly that. But we do take a lot of pride in the fact, too, that in the United States, you know, we spend a fraction of our income on food. Um, compared to other parts of the country, you look at developing countries around the world, you know, they may be spending 50, 60 percent of their income just to sustain themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, a while ago, I actually did a segment on this and I was comparing America now to America in the 80s. And we looked at several different things, automobiles, housing, that kind of thing. And the amount of uh, the as a percentage of the average American's income up until a couple of years ago, and all of those categories had been on a very steady decline. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that actually did tick up just a little bit was eating at restaurants. Yeah. And so the only one that actually did go up where agriculture was involved was eating at restaurants. And that's because the food got less expensive and they could afford to do that more often. And so uh, th their overall percentage of how much they spent on food actually has been decreasing. And I think that that is. Uh, largely, if not exclusively, because of the innovation and, and cost-cutting practices of American farmers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the farmers' innovations and then also the research that goes on at our universities around the country. Um, you know, we're fortunate in Alabama to have not one, but three land-grant universities. Um, mm -hmm. Auburn, Tuskegee, and Alabama A&M are all um, their missions focus around agriculture and agricultural research. So when you look at you know, taking that research and putting it in the hands of the farmer and then it's further, you know, refined and implemented out in the countryside. That is the one thing that I think really sets our farmers above other other farmers in the rest of the world is 
that research and the access to the technology that we have in our country and, and the, the, just the work ethic of the American farmer too plays a big role in that. Oh, absolutely. And one other thing I wanted to ask you about is, and I don't know how much you've studied this, but uh, one thing that is in Joe Biden's America, the beautiful plan, uh, mm -hmm. which really alarmed me, I think this has kind of flown largely under the radar, even in conservative media. Uh, but one provision that is contained in there is that they, their goal is to, according to, to this plan, own 30% of all American land by the year 2030. Now, you know, you don't have to be a mathematician to figure out for them to do that. They're going to have to buy an awful lot of private land that is currently owned by citizens. And a lot of that land just, I mean, by sheer math is going to have to be land that we use for farming. And so, uh, do you think the efforts there could, you know, impact farmers in a significant way? Yeah, you know, that, that particular proposal I have looked pretty closely at, and, and there's others out there as well, but the 30 by 30 proposal um, is very short on details. Um, there's right, it's, a, it's very, very general. Yeah, it's very vague. There's not a lot of specifics there. You know, for instance, you know, when you talk about conserving 30% of, of the land in the United States, what's the starting point for that? Are we going to say that the nat national parks, for example, that are already under federal ownership, do we start there or are we talking about an additional 30%? You know, the plan doesn't really talk about any of that. Um, the one thing that, and there's a lot of discussion, I, I'm kind of going on a tangent here a little bit, but there's a lot of discussion around the whole conservation theme in Washington right now. And, and what we're really pushing hard on is to make sure that farmers get credit for what they've already done. There's been conservation practices on farms since farming, you know, became a profession in this country. In more recent years, there's lots of voluntary programs that farmers are eligible to apply for through USDA. We need to take an, an account, we need to take stock of those practices that have already been implemented before we go out and recreate the, the wheel and try to push a whole new set of, of, of rules down on farmers. You know, our message around the whole conservation discussion right now is, you know, first off, it's gotta be voluntary. It, it's gotta be a, a carrot, not a stick approach. Our, our farmers are gonna fight it. They're not gonna embrace it. But if it's voluntary and there's some incentives tied to it that makes it worthwhile for the farmers to, to implement these practices, you know, we can have that discussion, but I am very much concerned about where this all may go. Um, you know, the 30 by 30 plan, going back to that, there's a lot of words there. It just doesn't say a whole lot, but we're having to mm -hmm. keep a really close eye on, on where the administration is headed with that for sure. Well, and I think that that is part of the reason I found it so alarming is because at least when a law, even if it's a bad law, if you can see it and know exactly what it's going to do, the fact that it eliminates the unknown there it at least allows you to prepare for it. The fact that this is just kind of thrown out there and there's very little definition given as to what conservation means, what it looks like, and whether or not federal ownership of land means that, you know, they're going to take it over and manage it or, or how that would work. But, um, you know, just throwing a theory out there. Let's say that when they look at farmland, they say, well, it's, it's going to be under federal ownership and federal management, but we'll allow the family farmers that are living on it now to stay there. I think that's going to be a deal breaker for an awful lot of farmers. I mean, most farmers yeah. don't want somebody else to own their land. That, I mean, heck, that would be uh, regressing back into feudalism back in like medieval uh, Europe where the king owned all the land. You were just allowed to live on it. <laughs> Um, and I don't think that that's what farmers want to go to part of the American dream and, and part of their desire. Cause I mean, nowadays, if you're a farmer, you're a farmer because you want to be a farmer. Like there's not farmers that are there because they, they can't do anything else. That may have been true in the past, but it's not now. And so, uh, if that is the case, I think that a lot of farmers, especially the ones here in Alabama are not going to take too kindly to the idea of, well, the Fed will own the land and, and we'll just allow you to live on it and cultivate it. I, I don't think that that's going to be uh, something that they're in favor of. Yeah, I would agree 100 percent. I mean, that goes against everything that, that our policy would stand on as far as land ownership and, and, and that type of thing. So that's something we would fight very hard. Um, you know, I guess as more specifics come up, come out around the 30 by 30 plan, we'll, we'll know kind of just like you were saying, we'll know what areas to really push back on. But at this point, it's, you know, we're not even sure, 
you know, what the, the proposal would actually do. Um, again, when you talk about conserving land, is that, um, is that, like you said, is that, is that federal government actually owning the property or is it the federal government saying that we're gonna incentivize farmers to implement certain practices and we'll check that box and say, hey, we've got a thousand acres that are, you know, planted in, in native grasses or whatever else. Who knows? There's just not any specifics there. Um, there was a bill that passed last week in the Senate that does put USDA on the track of um, setting up kind of some guidelines for carbon credits. So farmers uh, that are interested in, in, in taking on, um, you know, different practices where you would be able to sell that credit to another industry that needed to offset credits. There is at least some guidelines being set in place there. I'm not sure how popular it will be in our part of the world, but uh, again, if it's voluntary, if it's incentive based, if it's, uh, you know, the free market comes in and, and decides to get involved with that, I think we're certainly okay with that. There could be some potential in the Southeast, frankly, with the forest land that we have here. Trees sequester a whole lot of carbon. So, you know, depending on who's doing the math and, and how those credits are are allowed for, you know, there could be some opportunities there, but again, we're going to be very, very skeptical moving forward and make sure that, that there's um, not something that's going to be punitive toward our producers. Well, you know, I think, and I'm, I'm speculating a little bit here. Uh, I think the spirit of trying to say that we're going to be conserving 30% of the land and, and make sure that it's taken care of. Uh, I think that that is a somewhat misguided, if well-intended, outgrowth of this sort of belief of, of some people on the left, typically your environmental types, that kind of thing, that think that farmers come through and when they take care of a land or they cultivate the land, that they're actually doing some kind of harm to it. And they want to like maybe manage the practices when it comes to things like fertilizer, pesticide, that sort of thing. Uh, the problem with that is, and this is what I've said for a long time, people that, that claim that, you know, the, the vast majority of American farmers are mismanaging their land and abusing their animals or, or whatever. As I've said from the very beginning, is like, you do realize that's their asset, right? I mean, that would be like a used car salesman going out to his used car lot with a baseball bat and just hitting all of his cars with it. Like, it doesn't make any sense for them to abuse the land or abuse their livestock because that's how they make their money. And so I think that, you know, there, there's some good intention there with the desire to make sure that land is taken care of, but Nobody cares more about this land or more about their animals than the farmers that are actually managing them, if nothing else, just because it's in their interest to take care of them. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a financial interest there, um, you know, to protect what they, they use to make their livelihood. You know, and the other thing I would say, too, I mean, there's a deep, deep, profound respect and love for the land that they're able to, to enjoy making a living on. Um, you know, you talked about farmers that, you know, farmers want to farm. I think in some ways being a farmer is a little bit like being a preacher in that you've got to be called to do that. You know, farming is not for the, the faint of heart. It is not for, um, you know, it, it's not an easy profession. And uh, when, when you look at growing up, you know, particularly our family farms where they're three, four or five generations deep, you know, that, that's your community. I mean, that's, that's part of who you are and you absolutely want to do everything you can to protect that resource and, and, you know, improve upon it. Our farmers take a great deal of pride in, in having their property be attractive. You know, they, they work hard. It's, it's a, it's a point of pride. So yeah, it's absolutely in their economic interest to do so, but I think it goes a lot deeper than just economics. It is, um, it is something that's very near and dear to their heart. And, and you know, they're the hands-on, they're the real conservationists. I mean, when you want to talk about environmentalists and who's doing the work, they're doing the work every day. They're touching mm -hmm. that resource. They're touching, you know, that water. They're, they're protecting water quality. They're not in some skyscraper in New York, you know, talking about what, what should be done or, or what would be a good idea or, or what, you know, different theories. They're hands on. They're doing it every day. So, I mean, obviously they know a whole lot more than a lot of these other folks about what it takes to be a good steward. Well, and that goes back to something that I've held for a long time. By the way, I do think it's funny that you brought up. It's kind of like being a preacher because that's actually my other profession. Uh, but 
Um, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And that's always been the reason that I've been an advocate for control, especially when it comes to things like land and, and environment conservation being as close to the local level as possible, because you can't tell me that a farmer that has been on a piece of land and his family's owned it for 120 years, that some bureaucrat in Washington cares more about conserving that land than he does. And so it just makes sense, like you said, because there is a passion there. There's a, there's a connection to the land in that way. Um, it just makes sense for them to be the ones that are in charge of conserving it because they have the most interest in making sure it's conserved and conserved properly. Uh, but, you know, I appreciate you taking your time to speak with us today. And before you go, is there anything that I might not have thought to talk about anything that you think my audience might need to know when it comes to agriculture, particularly here in the state of Alabama? Well, you know, again, I, I would just say, you know, from an Alabama perspective, we've got, you know, great farmers that are, are working very hard to make sure they're getting a, a good quality product to the grocery store, to the restaurant. Um, you know, whether it's cotton, whether it's catfish, we've got a, a wide diversity of, of crops here in Alabama that we take a lot of a lot of pride in. It's a joy to come to work every day and advocate on their behalf. And uh, you know, right now we're playing a lot of defense from a policy standpoint. I think the last few years we had the opportunity to, to kind of be on the offensive side of things in terms of rolling back regulations and, and pushing back against some of the bureaucracy. Unfortunately, um, the, the tide has turned and, and we're in more of a defensive posture, but we're going to keep working hard to make sure that we do our very best to let our farmers continue to enjoy their way of life and produce food and fiber for the rest of us. Okay, so for anybody that might be watching this interview and understands the concern and would like to get involved, is there anything that they might be able to do to help out American farmers or Alabama farmers? Yeah, I would say the first thing is to, to try and support your local farmers. We have a, um, a new program in the state, the State Department of Agriculture is managing, it's called Sweet Grown Alabama. So there's a lot more branded product out there. Um, you know, you talked about, um, you know, supporting those local farmers and local communities. That, that's one way to do it is look for that brand. Um, you know that you're buying from an Alabama farmer. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you're not politically active, if you're not following politics, this is a, a really good time to pay attention to what's going on, regardless of, of what side of the aisle you may fall on. I think um, we need more people interested in the process, following what's going on and holding our elected officials accountable. So. Eat local and, and vote that would be two things that I would say would, would be very helpful. All right. Well, uh, simple but good advice, especially when you consider that some of the products that are grown right here in Alabama are absolutely fantastic. I know, uh, you know, I, I eat a lot of local honey. Um, I have friends that are in the beef production down here. Alabama beef is fantastic. And uh, sitting on my bed just a few feet from where I'm sitting right now are some red leg cotton sheets, which are grown right here in North Alabama. Yep. And so, yep. uh, I mean, there's believe me, you're not going to be disappointed. And there are a ton of ways to support your local farmers. So I would, I would say I couldn't agree more. Well, thanks so much for your time, Mr. Walker. It's always been a pleasure. Mitt Walker of the Alabama Farmers Federation. We thank you for joining us and, and ho hopefully our audience is a little better informed about Alabama agriculture as a result of our time here. Fantastic. Enjoy the, the conversation. Thank you, Caleb. <laughs> This is usually the part of the video where I ask you to like this video and subscribe to my show and click the notification bell. Does that guarantee you're going to get notifications when I post new content? Honestly, the way that YouTube censors conservatives, I really doubt it. But you know what liking and subscribing does do for sure? It ticks off the dark cyber overlords at Google when they see those likes and subscriptions despite shadow banning my conservative content. So you really should like and subscribe, if nothing else, just to stick it to them.